Um, so my name is Gary Nakuda. Um, I was asked to present the clinical perspective. Like many of you, I am a clinician in the trenches. And while PGTA seems very routine for many of us, I think there are still many um, uh, unanswered questions and controversies that we have to continue to recognize. So hopefully you can uh, relate to um, some of this content. Oops. Trying to advance. Oh, this is uh, the standard disclosure slide from Thermal Fisher. Uh, again, this is just me, the REI's perspective. Um, this is just a screen grab off um, the, the SART website. Can't hear? Better? Sorry about that. Um, <clears throat> this is a screen grab from the SART website, just uh, documenting some of the uh, innovation milestones in our field, um, dating back to um, the first IVF cycle in, in 1978. <laughs> And I think it's interesting that um, they note that PGTA has only been around since about 2007 or so, but they track PGTM back to the early 90s with work of Dr. Handyside and so forth. But I think it's fair to say that we've been aspiring uh, towards antipoiety screening of embryos for uh, close to three decades now, and we're still working on it. This is also a screen grab from the SART uh, website. Um, noting the increase in utilization of, of PGTA over the years from 2014 to 2018. In 2014, um, in the U.S., about 13% uh, of uh, clinics used PGTA. It increased to about 32% in 2017. Interesting pullback in 2018. I couldn't find more recent data, but I'm sure um, it's, it's increased since then. Um, the second panel also shows that um, the proportion of clinics that do more than 50% uh, of cycles of PGTA increased from 11% to 22%. So um, this is obviously something that continues to gain traction in our field. Um, so I am from the Olive Fertility Center, which is in Vancouver, uh, British Columbia, Canada, for those of you who don't know, it's that exotic country just north of the 49th parallel you should visit. Um, we do about 2,000 cycles of uh, IVF a year. And um, you know, from this pie chart, you can see that more than half of our cycles involve uh, PGTA. Uh, I think this is a fairly typical experience for a clinic of our size. Um, also, just as a side note, <clears throat> um, in British Columbia, um, IVF for t and any fertility treatment is not covered by the government. Private insurance doesn't pay for most of it, so this is out of pocket for most of our patients. <clears throat> I think we can all agree very much on the cl uh, clinical justification for PGTA in theory. If we could perfectly select euploid embryos and perfectly deselect aneuploid embryos, we would be dramatically reducing the treatment burden for our patients. Um, I think it's Non-controversial, uh, I think we would all agree that the incidence of aneuploidy increases with uh, maternal age. So um, the ability to screen for aneuploidy in theory is very appealing and makes a lot of sense. However, um, we also have to recognize that there are still many practical limitations. And there have been many noble attempts at uh, RCTs. Uh, we're all aware of the STAR study, which we participated in. Um, but despite our best efforts, uh, the evidence base is still lacking. I think there's still um, you know, um, a need for, for better direction. Um, but ultimately, we don't have all the answers we're looking for. Um, <clears throat> and I'm a big advocate of uh, PGTA for the right reasons um, uh, on an individualized basis. But I think we also have to recognize there are some very well-respected voices in our field who understandably are still quite skeptical of PGTA. This is uh, the editorial from Dr. Mastenbrock and Dr. Adashi uh, after the mo most recent New England Journal uh, paper last year. And they still believe that the use of PGTA is best limited to the research setting. That was in 2021. And if anybody has not read Dr. Paulson's editorial, which came out subsequent to the STAR study, I really urge you to do so. 
Again, Dr. Paulson is one of the, the giants in our fields. And it's a very interesting thought exercise in examining the idealized versus the realized outcomes um, after transferring euploid embryos. And um, his conclusion essentially is that we could be harming cumulative uh, live birth rates by performing PGTA. And the summary statement is whatever benefit was derived from the information about the ploidy of the embryo was offset by the trauma of the biopsy. So I think we have to recognize um, that this is a possibility. Shifting gears a bit, mosaicism is a big controversy. I think a lot of us have some discomfort still on how to handle this. Um, but thanks to um, Dr. Manuel Viotti's data, we have now over 1,000 cases and a pretty good evidence base um, supporting the fact that transferring uh, mosaic embryos is very reasonable, it's generally very safe, and the outcomes are quite good. Um, at our center, we're very comfortable with transferring mosaic embryos. Um, every patient gets individualized counseling. Um, I think every clinic that does PGTA needs to have a, a genetic counselor, at least one genetic counselor available. Um, that said, um, the risk of uh, anomalies after transferring uh, recognized mosaicisms is non-zero. There have been several reports in the literature about um, um, adverse fetal outcomes. This is a recent one um, from one of our neighboring clinics in Canada, which, which unfortunately happened after the very first time they transferred a mosaic embryo, which would um, obviously leave you a bit shell-shocked. The cost-benefit uh, analysis question I think is very interesting. This will vary significantly depending on your local economics. Um, but I think that there are good um, arguments um, just on the cost-benefit basis when to perform PGTA and when not to perform uh, PGTA. Uh, but this is something I think has to be analyzed uh, very locally. I uh, just threw this up. This is the Gartner hype cycle, which we're all uh, familiar with, I think. Um, and I just kind of overlaid some of the milestones of uh, PGTA. And I think we're up here right now at the plateau of productivity. We've, we've all kind of figured out how to use PGTA. Things haven't changed too much in the last couple of years. And what we need is a new innovation. And I think the future is non-invasive. Um, there's obvious advantages. If it's non-invasive, it's non-invasive. If there's no biopsy of the embryo, we, you know, at least we eliminate that risk of harm to the embryo. There could be lower costs, and some people believe that um, it, it is more accurate um, than uh, TE biopsy. Um, currently, there's limitations. It's technically very challenging. There's limited DNA for amplification. There's a lot of um, the risk of contamination and so forth, but I believe we'll get there. Uh, this is Dr. Rakowski's paper, and there have been several others. This was in PNA PNAS in 2019, correlating um, the uh, analysis of the cell-free DNA for non-invasive PGTA compared to the ICM uh, and the trophectoderm, um, and showed a very high correlation. And again, Dr. Rakowski suggested that um, analysis of the cell-free DNA might actually be a more accurate um, representation of the ploidy of the embryo than TE biopsy. And just as a little teaser, uh, tomorrow we have uh, an oral um, that we are presenting on um, our NISIS study, which is the non-invasive chromosomal screening, screening for embryo selection trial. It's a non-selection trial to really scrutinize our false positives. So if you guys are around, we'd love to see you there. Um, I believe it's tomorrow, 1130 or 1145, oral 239. And just summing it up, um, Embryonic aneuploidy is a fundamental principle cause of reproductive failure. I think we can all agree. Um, the ability to screen for aneuploidy is theoretically beneficial for all. Uh, however, the current limitations of PGTA technology cannot be denied and should be discussed with any patient considering PGTA. There are several unresolved issues. I think primarily the effect of the biopsy, um, the challenge of mosaicism, and um, the cost-benefit question. And I'd just like to make some predictions. I think in less than five years, we're going to be non-invasive um, for aneuploidy screening, at least. And, and again, my opinion, but I think the way to go is not um, you know, 
look for a binary determination of viability necessarily, but perhaps a ranking score. What we're trying to do here is screen. We're not necessarily trying to test or diagnose. And if we can encompass the non-invasive PGTA results with other factors, grading, morphokinetics, AI, what have you, then I think we can um, do a better job of individualizing embryo selection uh, for each patient.